Well, hello, everybody. I'm Nate, if I haven't met you. Thanks for coming to church. Thanks for tuning in. I, sometimes it's, it's um, I, important for us to remember there are a couple of thousand people that tune in every week. So we want you to know how glad we are that you're here with us. So a new year. Can I talk to you a little bit about the year 2022? What we're going to do? Okay. So I got to tell you this. I've thought about this for probably a decade. And I've always been a little too nervous to actually pull it off, okay? And I've never, I looked everywhere. I've never found a church that has tried this before. So I have to tell you at the beginning, this is either gonna be an incredible experiment or an absolute catastrophe. Those are the only two options, okay? Only two options. So here's what lies behind what we're thinking about for this coming year. So I, I'll start off this way. I think that we have a problem with the Bible. And I don't say that to like point a finger, make anybody feel guilty. Do you know the Bible sells 20 million copies a year? And somebody recently said the Bible is the most often purchased and least read book of all time, right? So I think we have an, like an emerging issue in our culture. And this isn't true for everybody. Some of you guys have like fantastic biblical practices in your life. And I just so admire that. But as a whole, I see this. I see that we've even changed how we've done church. Um, so anybody, if like you're kind of new to church or you, maybe you're here, we call it being spiritually unresolved and you're just investigating. You know, can I tell you about what my childhood in church looked like? Some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. We went to Sunday school, which was an hour before normal church, where you had kind of like an in-depth age-specific class and then we went to the regular adult service and then you took a lunch break and then we came back Sunday night for a Sunday night service and then we came back on Wednesday night for like the real in-depth Bible study service ladies and gentlemen that was four times a week when my parents got they met Jesus like we went from going to church twice a year at Christmas and Easter to four times a week. I could not figure what had happened to my family. Like this is what is happening. I'm at church all the time, but here was the advantage to that is we had a lot of time to expose people, to teach people the Bible. We're kind of in a new era where like even at this church, we'd say, hey, be a part of a small group and come to a weekend service. And that's kind of, you know, our emphasis right now. So we just, here's, there's a ton of people that say, I didn't really know the Bible growing up. I wasn't exposed to it. I meet parents all the time who say, I want to teach my kids about the Bible, but I feel too insecure. I just don't know enough about it. We have an issue with the Bible because culturally our mindset has changed. Um, a generation ago, you read the story of Joshua in the battle of Jericho. And you're like, that's awesome, right? You just hooted. You just, you know, instead of like attacking the city, you march around it and people sing worship songs and the priests blow these trumpets and the walls fall down. And that's the part of the kid's story. We stop there because the next part is what people today have a big issue with. It's called genocide. Everybody in the city is completely slaughtered. And I think the way there was a cultural respect for the Bible, we used to read that stuff and go like, well, you just got to trust God. Like, that doesn't seem very nice, but we just trust him. Today, here's what I find all the time. What in the world? God, I'm not okay with that. I'm disturbed by that. So we're asking some different questions. So I think we just have some issues with the Bible. So here's the goal. Next four weeks, we're just going to talk about the Bible. I'm going to try to address to the best of my ability some more major questions, four big questions this week, we're going to look at this. What did Jesus think about the Bible? Okay, because that's really important. Um, by the way, I think a lot of people like Jesus and don't like the Bible as much as they like Jesus. And is that even possible? Like, what, what should we do about that? And then, here's where we're going to go. The next, I don't know, 48 weeks, we're going to call it threads. And we're going to work our way through the big biblical Meta narrative, the big picture, the big themes, these threads that go throughout thousands of years of biblical history. We're going to talk about things I, I just outlined this week, the first 14, like blood. 
Blood is throughout the Bible. What does it mean? Well, how does it fit into the big theme? Um, mountains and deserts and trees. Example of trees, Genesis chapter two, we begin with these two trees. Human history begins with trees. Trees are mentioned. Genesis or Revelation chapter 22, the trees are back. How does that all, what's God doing in this big picture? So typically what we do at this church is we do expository teaching where I look at one passage of scripture. We look at the context. We really try to figure out what that passage is saying. This is going to be uncomfortable for me. It's going to be different every single week. We're going to look at multiple books of the Bible, multiple years of human history and figure out what these themes are. And here's why. At the end, I want everybody's biblical literacy to be elevated. So if you are like that sage old veteran of the Bible, I want you to understand the Bible better than ever before. And if you are at a starting spot where you're, could you please use last names when you say Abraham? Is this Abraham Lincoln or, you know, like I want you to understand the big, huge themes of the Bible, what God is saying to help us all move forward. So that's our goal. We're going to break it up into subsections, but 2022, here we come. Are you ready? Are you ready? Last year, I did the longest series of my life. I had a nine week series in the book of First Corinthians planned and we ended up doing like 19 weeks on it. If you didn't like that, you're in trouble. Okay. Um, with that in mind, just Bible getting it out there. We've got all kinds of study guides that are coming out, all kinds of visual things, videos, all of that. If you don't have a Bible, this is a great time. This is a free Bible that we always have available. If you're online, you don't have a Bible, let us know. We'll get this in your hand. This is a great little Bible. These are always available in the atrium. We just want to make some special things available. Here's a kid's Bible. I think this is like 10 bucks. It's not even what it costs us. If you have a kid, it's got pictures. It's got little comments there to help you. This, we... Um, Somebody who might say, yeah, yeah, I've got a, a Bible, but I want one of those with a bonded leather case to it. 10 bucks. Okay, so these are available for you. Get those. And then if you're saying, hey, I want to take it, uh, my Bible reading to like another level. This is a study Bible. This is one that I use. This NIV study Bible. It's got great notes. Helps you maybe ask the right questions. This is a little bit more expensive, but still about as cheap as we can make it at 20 bucks. So those are going to be available. We just want... Get a Bible in your hands any way we can. So this week, let's talk about Jesus in the Bible. I, I think we need to pause for a second and think about first century culture, okay? Jewish culture. So in first century Jewish culture, the entire education system was built around the Old Testament. So they called it the Tanakh, the Tanakh. So it's this word that brings in the Torah, which are the first five books of the Old Testament, the prophets and the writings. And so when you went to school, it was different than going to school in today's world. You go to school and you have like an ABC chart and you study science, you study. You know what the textbook was in the first century? It was the Old Testament. And you, you memorized it especially young men, you, just, you memorized it. And the way you learned to read was reading the Bible. And the way you learned to think and truth. And you looked at the Bible first and then science. You looked at the Bible first and then mathematics. And it's just how it was. And so when Jesus shows up on the scene in Israel, this is a culture that is like all about the Bible. It's probably even hard for us to grasp how focused on the Bible they were. And yet... We're going to read from three different portions of scripture today where Jesus says to this incredibly biblically literate culture, you're missing it. You're, you're completely missing it. And so in this first passage of scripture, it's going to be from Matthew chapter 5. We'll start at verse 17. We're going to see that Jesus has an incredibly high view of scripture. Okay, so the people he's dialoguing with are religious leaders of the day, Pharisees and Sadducees. I'll talk more about them in a moment. And they, they have a really elevated view of the Bible. They've memorized the first five books of it. Because, okay? by the way, you know, this is kind of new for us, being able to have a copy of this. Took a guy named uh, Gutenberg to uh, figure out how to print this. Bibles were kept in your local synagogue. They're on scrolls. You had to import papyrus, which was a type of uh, writing 
material from Egypt and the smallest, you know what a compact Old Testament was in the Old Testament in, the, in Jesus' day? It was 24 scrolls, massive scrolls. Scroll of Isaiah, the longest book in the Bible, was stretched from about here to the very corner of the room. It would be about this big, this wide, and you just read through it. So nobody had a Bible at home, but they studied it and went to synagogue and heard it read, and they heard rabbis teach about it. And Jesus is going to have... Uh, a view of the Bible that's higher than their view of the Bible. So Jesus has this really high view of the Bible. Let's read from Matthew chapter five, excuse me, where Jesus is talking to a group of people about the Bible. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. So Jesus was incredibly disruptive. He was so disruptive, especially for the religious leaders of the day. They had so many problems with him because he viewed God in a way they didn't view God and he taught things that they were terribly uncomfortable teaching and and he just stretched them. He disrupted them and people were so enticed and interested by the teachings of Jesus. And so here was one of their criticisms. They thought, this Jesus, man, he's not reading the same Bible we are. He's come to abolish all that. He doesn't even care about what the Old Testament says. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Don't think that I've come into the world to abolish the law or the prophets I have come, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them, fulfill them. So here's one thing that is really important if we want to learn how to study, especially the Old Testament. Jesus says this, all these things from Genesis to the book of Malachi, all the books written before the arrival of Jesus, to planet earth. Jesus says, when I came onto the scene, I didn't come to get rid of that. I didn't come to dismiss that. I came to fulfill it, to fulfill it. Jesus is saying this, that all of what God has been doing through the centuries, through the biblical writers, through his interactions with human beings has come to this point in that Jesus is the apex. That all of that points to him. And this is so helpful as we study, especially the Old Testament, things that we find difficult, cultural issues that are hard for us to comprehend. Look for how it's pointing to Jesus. And if I don't understand the Bible that way, I'll think that Jesus just came to disrupt everything. No, no, no. Jesus says, I didn't come to get rid of those things. I came to fulfill them. All of those ancient texts were pointing towards me. And we'll look at that in depth in this coming year. Jesus goes on. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, okay, you know what this actually says is that not the iota, which was the very smallest letter, it's tiny, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, and this um, in the original language is like it's a little tiny breathing mark that you put above the text to know where to, to breathe while you're reading it out loud, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus had such a high view of scripture that when he's talking to these people, he goes, it's all pointing to me. That's how you read it. That's how you interpret it. And there is, there's not like something that's dispensable. There's not anything in the Bible that is like unimportant, like the the tiniest letter, the tiniest little breathing mark, all of those are there on purpose and God has written them and they will come to a place of fulfillment. Jesus believed that the Bible had staying power, that it had authority, that it couldn't be dismissed. He goes on to say, therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands. So in the Old Testament, there are 613 commandments. That's a lot. We kind of think of the 10 commandments. That's a little bit more manageable number. There's 613. If you read through the book of Leviticus, you'll be like, yep, there's 613 of them. So anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So you want me to give you one of the 613 commands that's really easy for me to dismiss? There's a command that says, you shall not eat bats. 
Okay, not, not bats from baseball, but like flying hairy mammals that are absolutely disgusting. Here's my tendency. I read that command and I'm like, yes, sir, you got it. I, that is a command that I have never broken once in my life. Any of you? Just I want you to feel good about yourself. If you've never eaten a bat, you are righteous, okay? Well, here's what Jesus is saying. The challenge is, is when we read the Bibles, we can find things that, boy, out of those 613 commandments, like, ah, that one seems antiquated, right? That one seems uh, a little bit awkward. We'll talk about how do you differentiate between the different types of the law. We've got that coming up in a couple of weeks. But Jesus says, if you have a dismissive attitude towards the ancient scriptures, or if you teach people to be dismissive, which is easy to do when we read things that we don't understand that seem so awkward and so different. Jesus says, you're gonna be the least in the kingdom of heaven. What I want you to do is look at the whole thing, embrace the whole thing. Now, are there nuances? Are there things that are difficult to understand? Absolutely. But Jesus just says this, he has such a high view of scripture. He says every little letter, every little mark, every little command, all of it is important. And what's it all doing? It's pointing to Jesus. There's a purpose behind the Old Testament. So Jesus has a high view of scripture. And I would say this, if you love Jesus, you gotta know that Jesus loved the scriptures. And he wasn't talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He was talking about the Old Testament and find a way to have that perspective of the scriptures. Now, just a few verses farther down, continuing in Matthew chapter five, we're gonna read this, that Jesus was passionate about people understanding the Bible well. So I got bad news for you. In the first century, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, these people who were so dedicated to understanding, reading and teaching the Bible, misinterpreted it. And that happens today, right? And this is what Jesus says about that. Um, Matthew 21, 521, excuse me. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, so this phrase is gonna be used over and over. Jesus is gonna say this about multiple different things. He's referring back <clears throat> to a, one of the commandments, one of the 10 commandments, but more than anything, he's referring back to the way the teachers have taught this and they've taught it incorrectly. So you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, so everything you've heard about murder, this is, this is what you've been taught. The goal of life is don't kill people. All right, I can do that. I mean, like, like, yeah, yeah, I think I can manage that. But Jesus says, what you heard about that teaching has been bad teaching. People misinterpreted that. They boiled it down to make it as easy and palatable as possible. Jesus says, I'm gonna teach you what God really meant by this. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. But there's a big difference. How many people murdered somebody this week? How many of us were angry at somebody this week? All right, all right. Jesus puts them on the same level. He says, I'm gonna tell you that anyone who is angry at someone, and again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, which is an Aramaic word, it's an insult, how you would... Uh, it, it, it was like, look down on somebody. It says, Raka is answerable to the court. Just insulting people. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. What? Jesus says, what you were taught about murder? Bad teaching. God had a whole bigger system in mind. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you. So here's, here's the, the scenario. You're going to the temple. You're going to give an offering. You're trying to have this significant moment with God. You're going to worship. And while you're standing there getting ready, you remember, oh man, so-and-so is really mad at me. Not even that I'm mad at so-and-so, but so-and-so is really upset at me. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. Don't even bother going to God before you first go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. So Jesus takes this, do not murder, the goal is not to kill anybody. And Jesus says, oh no, no. 
the teaching that you should have been hearing that was really good behind what was God's heart is this, is I want to do whatever I can to be at peace with people. I, I want to value people, not call them a fool. I want to put my harmony with people, that there's forgiveness, that their mutual respect is more important, Jesus says, than you going doing another religious act. So here's, here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you've been taught wrong. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they've kind of minimized the teaching and they missed the whole heart of it. So one of our goals in the days ahead is to understand as well as we can. And here's the great news. You do not need advanced degrees to understand the Bible. One of my, um, I'm just going to be frank right now. One of my greatest concerns is that the way we do church encourages you not to read the Bible. It's my fault. What we do is um, we really emphasize the Bible around here. And I work really, really hard to be able to teach the Bible in a comprehensive, culturally uh, context appropriate way. And here, here's my fear, is that I read the Bible for you. And if I read the Bible for you, I am robbing you. Amen. I am robbing you. Um, I just drove by the other day, Golden Corral, and it's still empty. So all of you who don't live in Billings, there was this all-you-can-eat buffet that was completely mediocre food, but so much of it, so much of it. If, if physically this was your eating plan, I go to Golden Corral once a week and I eat so much that I'm fine for the rest of the week. That wouldn't work, would it? You'd be okay Sunday and maybe okay Monday, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you just couldn't sustain yourself on that type of eating plan. Like for $13.99, I feed myself for a week. <laughs> I eat so much fried chicken. <laughs> I think we do the same thing spiritually. Hey, let's just go have a nice big buffet. Nate, you go study the Bible all week and then come back and like lay it out. And hopefully it's not mediocre food. Like, oh yeah, this is passable. And, I'm, and I eat, listen, the Bible is for every one of us. Every one of us. It, it's, it's so incredibly important. And so um, Jesus was passionate about people understanding the Bible. We're going to talk a little bit about hermeneutics in the weeks ahead. <laughs> so what is hermeneutics? It kind of sounds like a disease, right? One day you hope your doctor doesn't come to you and go, mm, I'm sorry to tell you, but uh, you have a bad case of hermeneutics. Uh, here's what hermeneutics is. It's the art and science of reading the Bible well. And Jesus attacks the hermeneutics of the Bible teachers in the first century. And so hermeneutics involves three things. Okay, if we just boiled it down to its basics. One, it would be the revelation or the observation that there's something divine that you're reading. Okay. And the second step in hermeneutics is interpretation. What does it mean? And this is where Jesus says, you failed at this. You, you're trying to make it mean something that it doesn't actually mean. And then here's the third step, and this is probably the most important. The application is how do we live the text out? And Jesus is jumping on the people in Matthew chapter 5 by saying, you've read this, you've studied it, and here's the problem. You don't live it out. So Jesus is saying this, you could love the Bible, you could read the Bible, you could revere the Bible, you could memorize the Bible. But if you never get to this last step where you apply it to your life, where you do the really hard things about loving your enemy, forgiving, turning the other cheek, all you have is Bible knowledge and you have never been transformed. Have you ever met a mean disciple of Jesus? Oh, you haven't? I've met so many and it makes me so mad. You know why it happens? Because of this. We do the first two. And we never apply it. Jesus says, I want you to apply it to your life. Now, here's the third and final thing. Um, Jesus is going to speak to the Sadducees, this is Mark chapter 12, about uh, their misinterpretation of the scriptures. Okay, now, before we read this, I, I want you to think about the Sadducees. There's about 70 of them at any given time. 
And it was this incredibly lofty group of people, uh, very, very well read. They were scholars, they interpreted the law. This group of 70 men who led the nation. If you had a question, they were the ultimate authority. Probably our equivalent would be the Supreme Court. Okay, the Supreme Court, but in a religious context. So in the first century, there's this raging theological debate. By the way, did you know that there were theological debates 2,000 years ago? And they still happen. Here's the debate, though. What happens when a human being dies? So another party of people called the Pharisees, who were very powerful, they read the Old Testament scriptures, and they came to this really clear conclusion for them that there was life after this life and not just a spiritual life. So they believed in this thing called bodily resurrection. That one day when the Messiah came back, that dead people who had been buried, not would they only be spiritually alive, but they would be physically resurrected as well. Well, Sadducees, who are the most elite, the Sadducees read the same Old Testament and they go, not a chance. Like, what's gonna happen? You've been in the grave for 10 centuries Like, we know what happens. It's decomposition. You're not going to be resurrected. That's an impossibility. So they they had this whole belief that the life after this life was only spiritual. It was metaphysical. It wasn't physical at all. And so here's what the Sadducees think. They think that Jesus, they, they have a feeling that he sides with the Pharisees on this. That Jesus believes in some sort of bodily resurrection. So they want to test him. So they bring up a scenario. Here's the scenario, Mark chapter 12. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him, Jesus, with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Pause here for just a moment. Now, in our culture, this seems really weird. Anybody you thought like, Marry my brother-in-law, ah, right? So in ancient culture, women were unbelievably vulnerable. If you were a widow, because women could not own property, because women oftentimes couldn't even have bank accounts, if your husband died and you didn't have children, your future was very bleak, very bleak. There's no social systems involved. You know what retirement was in the ancient world? is you had children and you had as many children as possible so they could take care of you when you couldn't work any longer, right? And so the Sadducees make up this scenario. They say there's a woman and she becomes a widow. They didn't have any kids. Now she's vulnerable. So this is what God said in the Old Testament. He said, now the brothers of her husband are responsible for her. One of them should take her and marry her, make him his wife, so that, make her his wife so that she can have a secure future. Now, there were seven brothers. Oop, can we go back? We didn't read it all. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. Now, this is where they're trying to trick Jesus. At the resurrection, this so-called resurrection, whose wife will she be? since the seven were married to her. So this is what the Sadducees are thinking. So you believe in a resurrection, huh? Well, one day, how about this woman and her seven husbands all show up in heaven and she's like, I don't know, they're all my husband. Like, who do I spend eternity with? So they think this this disproves the resurrection. Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures? Two reasons why we misunderstand the Bible right here. These are powerful. Number one, you do not know the scriptures. Now remember, he is saying this to the Sadducees, the most highly educated, most well-respected Bible teachers in the first century. And he says, you do not know the scriptures. Here's the second reason why we misunderstand the Bible. Or the power of God. See, you don't get this. Two reasons. You misunderstand the scriptures. You don't know them. You've read them. 
you're familiar, but you don't actually know what God is doing. You don't know who he is and you don't have a big enough God. Let's go on. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, here's the point of this, God uses first person present tense, I am the God of Abraham. It's not, I was the God of Abraham. Like Abraham's gonna be around. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Okay, how do we understand the Bible well? Here's two things that we gotta avoid. One is reading the scriptures, but not knowing the author. Okay, in John chapter five, Jesus says this to another group of Pharisees. Pharisees. He says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that by them, by the scriptures, you have life. But here I am, Jesus says, the very one about whom these scriptures speak and you don't recognize me. Okay, so I could be a Sadducee, I could be a Pharisee, I could be the best Bible student in the world, but not see Jesus. The point of reading the Bible is encountering the risen Jesus, okay? And then here's the second thing. If you don't have, if I don't have a big enough perspective on who God is and on his power, I won't be able to read the Bible right. So for the Sadducees, like there's no way decomposed matter can come back together and God can restore it. And Jesus is saying, are you kidding me? What happened in Genesis chapter two? I'll tell you what happened. The first human being was created out of the dust of the earth. And you think that the God who created humans out of dust won't be able to recreate a human being out of dust? And this is so helpful. When we read things in the Old Testament that are challenging, that seem to defy science, there's, a, there's an account of a battle that's raging and the sun stands still so that the battle can be won. Anybody like, I don't know, sun standing still? Seems like we could have some cosmic issues with that. Like, aren't we gonna burn on one side? You know, what, what's gonna happen? This is what Jesus says. It's because you don't have a big enough view of God. You think God couldn't suspend laws of science and physics to accomplish his purpose? So when I come to different parts of the text that are really difficult, I realize one of the key things for me is to understand how big my God is. That he could do things that I can't comprehend so I don't want to just dismiss the text because ah, that's scientifically impossible. Not impossible with God. Not impossible with God. I want to conclude with just a couple of statements. Number one, if we're going to wrap all this up. Life is, found, is not found, okay, is not found in the Bible. Now I know this runs contrary to what a lot of people, like a lot of Christian phrases you hear um, yeah, you got to get into the word. I find life in the word. <clears throat> Jesus is really clear. He's talking to Bible people in every one of these conversations. He says, life is not found in the Bible. Life is found in Jesus and Jesus is found in the Bible. So when I read the Bible, what am I looking for? I'm looking for Jesus. I'm looking for Jesus. So in this year, as you move forward, look for Jesus in the Bible. The goal is not to read more and more Bible. The goal is to know the author better than ever before. Second one, the point is not to study, the point is relationship. I can be familiar with the Bible and unfamiliar with Jesus. And this to me is terrifying. Someone who does what I do, I could be familiar with the Bible and unfamiliar with Jesus. It's exactly what happened to the Pharisees. The point is not to know the Bible, the point is to know the author of the Bible. And lastly, Read the Bible for formation, not information. So my goal is not to win at Bible trivia the next time I take it. You know, I play that game. The goal of the Bible, I've got three, a couple weeks from now, we're going to talk about this. The goal of reading the Bible is that I could be shaped and formed and I apply it and I put it into practice and I struggle with it and I submit to it. Not that I get smarter and smarter in biblical things, is that I am shaped into the image of Jesus. So this week, as we go, as we think about 2022, a couple of things. One, 
I'm gonna ask you this. Would you read the Bible? Stretch yourself more than you ever have before. If you've read the Bible once a month, read the Bible once a week, right? Whatever it is, make a step, stretch yourself. I'm stretching myself this year in my Bible reading. Two, watch it, listen to it, use media. We have this unbelievable capacity now. I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of Bible project videos in the weeks ahead. Um, you know what I'm doing? I, I listened to books last year. I'm a, I'm a reader, but I felt like I needed to read more. Last year, I made my way through 87 books by listening to them. It drives my wife crazy. She's talking to me and I have earphones in because I'm reading another book or listening. I'm listening to the Bible. Yesterday, I was working in my garage. I got through 40 chapters. I was asking questions. Pause it. Listen, think about that. So read it, watch it, think about it. So the goal is we're going to talk about meditation in the future. The, it's not just hearing or reading. It's digesting. It's asking potent, changing questions. And then lastly, talk about it. Talk about it. I'm going to start all kinds of new small groups for people to sit down and talk about their struggles, what they're reading, what they've seen, revelations they've experienced from the Bible. 